Super, good evening. Thank you everybody for joining us at this Stop Waste Incinerator talk this evening. I'm your host, Laura Baldwin. I am involved in the Stop Portland Waste Incinerator campaign. I literally live on the hill above where this monster of a contraption will hopefully never be <laughs> because it would be pretty ghastly to live amongst such a thing. Um, little housekeeping before we get started, if you could all keep your um, mics muted whilst you're not speaking, just to avoid any interruption. Um, in order to do that, either bottom left of your screen, you'll see a little microphone symbol and a mute if you click on that. Alternatively, if you hover your cursor over your image, there's three dots top right. And there's also the option to mute and unmute in there. So this evening, we've got three great speakers who are going to share their wealth of knowledge and experience with you all. Um, first up will be George Elliott Smith who is just such a legend. I really admire this lady. Um, sustainability consultant and engineer, former UNESCO Special Envoy for Youth and Environment and environmental activist, who has been so proactive and really on the front of trying to stop waste incineration, full stop in this country. And even lining up in Europe and trying to stop it globally has uh, got to be the goal. <laughs> If it's no good here, it's no good anywhere. Um, next up will be Raj Pereira of the Stop Edmonton Incinerator campaign. And last but not least will be Paula Klensky of the Stop Portland Waste Incinerator campaign. Um, we'll have a couple of questions after each speaker, um, but we'll save most of the questions until the end so that we've definitely got time for each of our speakers. It'll be a maximum of an hour and a half. Um, uh, George has got to leave us after an hour. So without any further delay, we shall move on and introduce Georgia, our first speaker. Hi, um, my name's Georgia Elliot Smith. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I feel like it's been a little while since I talked about incineration because it was like my whole life for about three years and now I sort of for the sake of my sanity taken a half step back before kind of diving back into it again and I think that's such an important part of this campaigning actually is that it can be so overwhelming particularly when you're fighting what seem to be these forces that are just not listening and so powerful and it's like this whole train in motion that we as campaigners are trying to um, tackle so it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, at the moment, you know, taking slightly, well, I say slightly a back seat, actually, even as those words come out of my mouth, it's ridiculous, because up until about maybe three weeks ago, I was still involved in another legal challenge against the Edmonton incinerator, which my <laughs> co-conspirator Raj obviously is, is up next, so we'll hear all about the battles at Edmonton, but yeah, it's um, it's been a long journey, and I think um, I'll, what I'll do is just describe how I got involved with it, and then what we've been doing since I got involved. So, my first um, exposure really to incineration is that I'm an environmental engineer by background. I work in the construction sector, and as a result of that, I do a lot of work in the waste in waste management and and the waste management sector in in my work. And um, because of that, I um, I had been to waste incinerators in the past to conduct supply chain audits and uh, and as far as I was concerned waste incineration was a viable part of the waste hierarchy I had no particular problem with it as long as they were aligned you know as long as they were meeting limits in permits and so on and uh, were not breaking the law then I was perfectly satisfied with that and that I think was the most interesting part for me was how as a professional in the sector I had no problem with incineration at all and it's only really been through my campaigning life and through my activist life that I've really understood the problems with incineration and as a result have kind of come to it as a as a an enlightened professional now and I'm doing my best to try and debunk the myths that you know, I, I accepted as truths. 
um, amongst my professional community. And um, I'm doing some work now with architects, developers, housing associations, and so on, specifically to attack really uh, the, well, not attack, maybe that's too much of a strong word for it, but to unpick the greenwashing around district heat networks linked to incinerators. Because what we're finding, as I mentioned to, the, to Laura just before we started recording, was it feels like waste incineration is the hydra. You know, and every time you attack it and you lop off one, you know, limb or head, you know, another one pops up. And the current problem that we've got in London and throughout the rest of the UK and the world is that waste incinerators have now realized that they have this um, trump card, which is around decarbonized heat networks. And actually, if they can use the waste heat from incinerators, then that links into this green heat economy. But what they're doing is that isn't actually strictly waste heat that already exists. They're using that as a pro to build more waste incineration capacity. So actually it's putting very much the cart before the horse. And this is what we're finding at Edmonton is they're building in this you know, low carbon heat as a benefit of extending and building new incinerators. And that is really not the intention. It is not a low carbon source of heat. Burning plastics and rubbish is really poor. And when we look at the carbon, the other pollution that comes out from incinerators and also the impact on the circular economy, we see that actually incinerators just should not be built. And we should be talking about truly unavoidable waste heat that comes out from industrial processes that we should be harnessing, not building excess capacity in incinerators that we can then um, feed into these heat networks. So I'm currently working with professionals in the property sector on a thought leadership piece um, sp dealing specifically with why local authorities should not buy into heat networks linked to incinerators. And so uh, that's coming out in the next couple of months and um, I'll put that on all my social media so you can see it. Um, separate to that, as I say, I came to this um, as a, an industry a construction industry professional. I first, my first contact with the Stop the Edmonton Waste Incinerator, which is my local um, campaign, was I had uh, become engaged with Extinction Rebellion. I was at my local Extinction Rebellion um, meeting, and this incredible ball of energy at Karina Millstone came into one of our meetings and just went you know and just like totally unloaded two years worth of anti-incinerator campaigning on us in about 15 minutes and all of us were like oh my god and I have to say you know she had been fighting this Edmonton incinerator which Raj will tell you all about she'd been fighting it for two years as a local resident and had was just exhausted you know reached a point of exhaustion she had attempted a judicial review of the planning consent and failed and she was at her wits end and she came to our meeting to try and help raise an army of support um which is really what she did you know and we then I got involved I have to say when I again when I first heard her pitch about this as that skeptical professional I was just thinking oh you know this is real nimbyism, you know, what do they expect we're going to do with the waste? And this is actually solving two problems with one solution, you know, it's disposing of waste, it's creating low carbon energy. And But then I, I sort of withheld true judgment and I thought, no, I'm actually going to dig into this because if I've learned anything, it's that the greenwash is very insidious, you know, about all technologies. And so I went and did my research and that's when I really started unpicking the seams and realising I was wrong. So I got very heavily involved. And then through being involved with Extinction Rebellion, through being involved with the incinerator campaign, um, I started to reflect on my highest value really to this campaign, which being an engineer, being sort of technically involved somewhat in this, um, I realized I could do more than just, you know, waving placards and lying in the street and that sort of thing. I thought, I can I can do more here. And I met 
a legal team, which is another separate story. Um, it was actually, actually, it was the, set, the legal team that had represented Karina in her anti Edmonton um, legal case and started talking to them about we, we, instead of fighting all of these local incinerators who are always able to say they're not doing anything illegal. And it's kind of true, you know, that it's, it's, it's unethical, it's immoral, you know, all of those things, it's not right. They are not always doing anything particularly illegal. Um, it's just the system is wrong. So what we need to do is try and attack the system and try and take it up to the point where, you know, how is it that incineration as a technology is proliferating so fast, you know, that it's just being rolled out everywhere. Um, what can we do to stop the tap, you know, to turn off the tap at source rather than just try and bail out the bathtub? Um, so this was at the time that this new future of UK carbon pricing document had come out. And actually, as it turned out, Brexit offered this opportunity to challenge a lot of environmental regulation because you only get, I didn't know this, I'm not a lawyer. You know, I've learned so much in my legal journey. You cannot challenge a government policy because it's bad. You can only challenge it within three months of it being published. Um, that is, them's the rules, you know, and beyond three months, you lose your ability to challenge it. And so we were talking and during, you know, while we were talking, this future of UK carbon pricing was published and we recognised an opportunity to actually deal with some form of carbon pricing, which I think is one of the main reasons that incineration is allowed to proliferate because it doesn't have to pay for any of its emissions. You know, it's an externality. Society picks up the tab for the pollution that's being created by these incinerators, not the technology provider or operator themselves. And so um, that's where my legal case started to try and get incinerators included in the emissions trading scheme. So, um, you know, spoiler, we didn't win. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't win. Um, but what we did do in that case, I'm still incredibly proud. And um, one really great thing that came out of it was in the findings of my case, the judge um, stated in the ruling that the, the Paris Agreement demands urgent short term action, that you cannot just kick the can down the road until 2050. And that's the first time that's ever been stated in a UK, in, a, in an English court. And so that now has created a precedent for other climate related cases to build on. And what I hadn't appreciated when I went into this is that because climate litigation is so new, everything to do with net zero is so new. There is no case law there really to build on nothing significant. So every opportunity we get as campaigners to actually go to court creates another brick in the wall, you know, another step on the ladder towards achieving a low carbon future, you know, because these things, they require precedents to be set, they require judgments to be made. And even if you lose, there are these micro decisions within the macro judgment that other cases can use to build upon. And so it is so important, you know, as a tactic, this legal activism, if, if you are you know, able to do that. So anyway, on to a bit more about incineration. So one um, thing that has happened since my court case, which has been so great, is that there were whisperings. It, it actually came out in the Telegraph and the Independent, I think, a few months ago, that actually in my case, the government promised that they would review the emissions trading scheme this year, and they would consult on whether or not to bring incinerators into scope. And we heard some um, rumors from Westminster that were then published in the papers that actually they will be uh, strongly pushing ministers now for inclusion of incinerators in the emissions trading scheme because, <laughs> Not only have they been challenged on it, but also because it's a relatively straightforward thing for them to do. The alternative is to put more tax onto households and their carbon emissions from their energy consumption, which clearly is not a vote winner. 
whereas taxing dirty waste incinerators probably you know won't impact the electorate as much and so uh they're thinking about that as being a, a tactic so actually in the long run you know we think that there will be this additional tax pressure on incinerators to account for their emissions what that doesn't unfortunately do is deal with the here and now of the incinerators like the one you're fighting like the one we're fighting getting you know scraping their way through into development in advance of these things happening but what it does do is helps us to highlight to our local authorities this negative future cost impact where the incinerator doesn't have any emissions mitigation meaning carbon capture and storage which is basically pie in the sky you know carbon capture and storage for incinerator technology is just an absolute blooming nonsense you know why would you burn stable stored carbon and then pay tech for technology to remove it from the emissions it's just an utter nonsense um so the, you know it, it is building the case another thing that's going on at the moment which i'm finding really interesting is um and and i i presented to the all party parliamentary group on air pollution on this and if you haven't seen the paper that came out from their meeting in uh when was it it was back in sort of september time 2021 garrett davis mp produced a paper off the back of that appg asking parliament to put a moratorium on all waste incinerators on the basis of air pollution and the precautionary principle and there's been new research that has just been published last week i think by zero waste europe uh reporting on dioxin levels they've been conducting with a, a another charity called toxico watch in three countries in europe um some biomonitoring studies around waste incinerators and modern waste incinerator facilities as well not not dirty old ones i say dirty old ones as if they're not dirty new ones um and those results have just been published and they have found that the dioxin levels around the waste incinerators let me get the um the actual figures for you um they have found from their biomonitoring that uh up to 90% of the samples um exceeded safe dioxin levels they also found that um pcbs pfas which is the I don't know if you've seen Dark Waters, but the forever chemical that's um, the subject of the film Dark Waters um, were in very high levels. In fact, um, even you know some of the volatile organic compounds that they found were 87 times um, the comparison reference source. Uh, so it it's definitely worth taking a look at that and unpicking all of that information because this is all new research that's now coming to light. Sorry, time, have I, how much time do I have? Shall I, sum, shall I just close up now? Cause I could go on like this all night. <laughs> <laughs> it is so interesting hearing from you, Georgia. Um, a, couple, a few more minutes. Yeah, a couple oh, more minutes. Yeah. I'll just close up, I'll just close up. Um, I think one of the, one of the key points that for me has been the most concerning has been data that's come out from the incinerator industry itself. And this is from the Tolvik um, waste incinerate, energy from waste industry reports that are published annually. And what we see from those reports is, a, I think, 2020 was the first year that they reported on abnormal operating hours and these should be really worrying to everybody because what we have found is that um in the 2020 report the 39 uk incinerators that actually reported uh their data that's out of almost 50, so only 39 reported their data. 
there were 127 emissions permit breaches across 39 incinerators and 226 abnormal operating hours. Now, an abnormal operating hour is a, is a point at which it can be a shutdown, it can be uh, a startup, it can be a, an equipment failure, it could be the, a failure of filtration equipment, it could be um, other kinds of technical or human error. But the problem with that is there is no data to record the emissions during those abnormal hours. Because the way in which emissions are reported is over averages and is self-reported. And we know the Environment Agency is under-resourced, under-financed, you know, stretched to its limits. And they are not an effective watchdog or um, police or prosecutor, essentially, of these offences. And we are dealing with some of the most toxic substances known to science here. You know, we're talking about dioxins and furans and heavy metals and um, persistent organic pollutants that are linked to awful diseases, which I know you know all about. But this is really an emerging science here to try and understand what's really going on. And this has been shrouded in mystery and, you know, redacted documents. And those abnormal hours, to me, are incredibly worrying because they're a real blind spot about what is going on. And I think this is why the biomonitoring exercises are so interesting, because they are taking actual soil data and data from food produced in the local area, eggs and crops and so on. And dioxins are a persistent organic pollutant. They, they build up like DDT, they build up in fatty tissues, in food, in human beings, in the things that we eat. And they build up over time and they contribute to these um, diseases. And I think the precautionary principle and things like the Stockholm Convention, again, I will finish now, but I, you know, I can go on about this for such a long time. Every stone I look under makes me more and more concerned because the Stockholm Convention, you know, I, I believe there's a legal case out there about how waste incinerators are in contravention of the Stockholm Convention because they are not destroying these persistent organic pollutants. They're allowing them to persist in nature. Um, and the, the more time marches on, the more we're understanding this. And so I'll kind of leave you with that. I know it sounds pretty bleak but you know there are some great people like yourselves fighting all of this so I have great hope but you know it's uh, it is a constant march onwards so I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any thank you brilliant thank you Georgia that's really fantastic fantastic in the way that you explain it to us and just bring us more ammunition that we can use in our cases and um, as if there should need to be any more like surely what we've discovered already is enough to put to follow Wales and, and Scotland and just put a pause at least whilst it's investigated further. Um, right so I have unpicked the spotlight but it, on my screen still seems to be spotlit. I was just trying to bring everybody back onto the screen. Um, don't know if anybody is able to help me with that but we shall continue anyway so a couple of questions then if you would like quickly to ask a question now of Georgia whilst we have her attention especially as she needs to leave early um if you want to just put your raise your hand using the reactions or write it in the chat and we'll call you in okay I can see a hand raised there so Doug Douglas, would you like to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? I can, yes, carry on. Um, yeah, thanks, Georgia. I, I just wanted to ask about the 127 emissions that um, were bre uh, permit breaches and what the enforcement procedure is on that. Uh, is there any way that it's enforced? because I'm not sure what it means, permit breaches. Is there any repercussions for the companies having admitted the 127 breaches? So, um, 
the answer is I I can only, I can only partially answer that because different incinerators operate in slightly different ways. Um, if we look at Edmonton, for example, they self-select when to um, take their readings of their emissions. Um, so it, it's quite enlightening that not all incinerators have reported their abnormal hours. Um, they don't have to do that. They just report their emissions and their emissions are selected at a point when they're running at their optimum um, operating um, function. Um, and so it is left to the operator to report abnormal hours and to report readings of pollutants from those um, instances. Now, we picked up, for example, at Edmonton, a reading that was 200 micrograms of mercury when their permitted level was 20, approximately. And when we wrote to them about it, they said, oh, it's just a typo. Now, to me, that seems completely insane that on their own self-reporting, they can say, oh, it's just a typo. You know, there was no follow up. The Environment Agency didn't chase it up. They simply claimed that, oh, there's nothing to see here. And so I have no confidence at all that this is being um, taken seriously, really, by anybody. It seems to be a carte blanche to just keep reporting, you know, as long as you submit your report, we won't really ask any questions unless something's so egregious or there's a complaint raised, in which case, you know, we'll send an officer out to investigate. Um, that's basically, that, that's all I can really say on that. You know, we've seen no action from the Environment Agency at all over these exceedances. It only seems to be when there is a huge outcry from the public that anything seems to be done about it. And like I say, you know, these things are all self-reported. Nobody's watching from the outside. Nobody's checking these figures. They're just, it's all on trust. Now, the, when I say the, the exceedances, that can be anything. You know, I mentioned mercury there. That was emissions to water from the incinerator. Um, but obviously the, the emissions to air as well. Um, some of them have inline monitoring so that they will monitor the actual gases coming out of the chimney. Others will monitor from a radius near to the facility and then they will model their emissions. In fact, I, I understand that the vast majority of incinerators do only, um, they don't do any actual monitoring of the air at all. All they do is they extrapolate their emissions data based on the type and quantities of waste that they've burnt in a given period so it's all model data it's not actual air quality data at all it's very right. murky it does sound very murky indeed and really not acceptable when it's such a hazard to our health it's just unforgivable um lynn then phil two quick questions lynn first thanks georgia that was really really informative. Um, I'm coming at it as a, a health worker and I thought what you know what the self-monitoring is is, for, is absolutely frightening. Um, you probably remember there was a judgment um, a young a, a child died and her mother and she died of air pollution in South London and her mother fought to get a ruling that she had died as a result of pollution. Um, and I, I wondered if there was any, you know, um, whether or not local GPs would be measuring, any fit in measuring things like dioxins and mercury or any of these things in the blood and looking at it, you know, we know historically there was things like, you know, lead poisoning from living near motorways um, and whether, you know, what your thoughts are really about, about that, especially as you say quite rightly. We... We're losing you there, Lynn, yeah. with your I, bandwidth. I got it. I yeah. Think, um, um, thanks. Yeah, I got the, I got the question. Um, 
actually, let me just grab a piece of paper because I want to make some notes about links to send you to all of these studies. Hang on. <laughs> um, Rosa Kissy Deborah is a friend of mine, and it was her daughter, Ella Kissy Deborah, who was uh, the girl that died. And we campaigned together on a number of platforms. You know, we're, we're members of a couple of the same committees and things. Um, and yeah, you know, she's she's incredible, really, really passionate and, and powerful advocate. Um, and yes, you are absolutely right. There is um, there's a huge interest in this, and this is massively important, particularly, you know, for us in Edmonton, an urban, heavily built up, racially diverse, very, um, very economically deprived. Um, community where this you know just because they've been living under the shadow of an incinerator now since the 1950s you know people just assume it's okay to build another one and I think you know there's an element here of a huge element you know Raj is going to talk about it next and a huge element of environmental justice here about we we are putting this industrial facility into heavily built up areas where communities are hugely vulnerable and um, assuming that it's okay you know not taking the R authorities are not really looking at the data they've shut down they are you know they're looking at the greenwash from the waste authority and the reality is they're just doing it for money you know they're doing it because it's cheap and they're tied into a contract and they, you know it, it, there's a there, it's there's a lot of reasons it's very insidious we had a presentation um and i'll send you i think the appg might have some of the information but there is another study where um researchers looked at the some data from children the toenails of children they analyzed heavy metals that they could find in those toenails and they were able to discover that those living close to incinerators had much higher levels of toxins in their bodies um, i can send you a link to that but also there was a, a global meta study that was conducted um, in 20 uh, 2019 it was published and it's really powerful. Now, our authorities have dismissed it. They keep falling back on this public health, you know, UCL, uh, sorry, Imperial College study that says incinerators are benign. Um, one study, this global meta study looked at 93 scientific research papers from across the world. And it concluded that there was, and I was, I'm reading it here off my presentation to the APPG, plausibility for a causal link between waste incinerators and congenital anomalies and miscarriage. And so they found plausible links and they said that the, it highlights significant risks from waste incineration. It concluded there's insufficient evidence to conclude that any waste incinerator is safe. And that although there's suggestion that newer technologies are less harmful, these diseases tend to manifest only over many years of exposure. And so they recommend that the precautionary principle must be applied by authorities in all cases before approving an incinerator. And so, you know, these studies are out there. I'll, I'll send you the link to that. But we need our, you know, we need our decision makers to listen and stop thinking that we are just nimby, you know, crazy people. And look at the evidence in front of them, not just take evidence from one study, look at a meta study that's looked at almost a hundred of these papers. Um, yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. Phil, do you want to ask your question now or do you want to wait until the end? I'll ask it now, it's, but I'll make it very quick if I may, Laura. Um, Georgia, you know, you've, you've several times mentioned the Environment Agency, and this looks like an increasingly toothless body. I mean, if, if I'm correct, it's the Environment Agency, which at various points in the last year or so has been giving the go ahead for water authorities to release untreated sewage, lar large volumes of it. And I think there have been a lot of releases in Dorset both on the coast and inland on our rivers in, in, the, in the most recent period. And it's as if the Environment Agency hardly exists as a, 
an organization to which one can turn. Um, is it the case that uh, in relation to incinerators and the type of example you've just given, that the Environment Agency is not a very credible body and certainly one that doesn't seem to be looking after community's interests? Uh, I, I have some sympathy for the Environment Agency because I think like many public bodies, they have undergone years and years, decades really, of budget cuts, you know, they've been undermined in their authority and their ability to intervene. And they're now so stretched in their resources that they are effectively toothless. And so all they've really become, I believe, and I, I know many other professionals in industry feel the same, they have become simply a bureaucratic paper shuffling body that receives permits and issues paperwork and when it comes to their enforcement powers they have the powers but they don't have the resources to be able to get officers on the ground going through documents undertaking monitoring and measurement and going through the extremely expensive process of enforcement and court action which is what this requires because you know these corporates that they're up against like the incinerator operators they make you know they're multi-billion pound operations you know and they will get snagged up in a uh, legal process for years and years and they simply don't have the resources so all they can really do is prosecute those that are at the top of the list in terms of um reputation and public interest you know the most winnable cases that's not in the public interest you know we need strong public bodies strong independent public authorities with us with the power with the remit to effectively make the polluter pay but in most cases the polluter profits unfortunately and so this is why we really need system change you know and i've i fundamentally believe that that comes from political and legal activism um, to try and drive the change at the top you know and, and of course you know the the grassroots activism to drive that from the bottom as well and I think you have to have those two things together. Excellent thank you so much Georgia and that leads so well and nicely into our next speaker as well Raj who's going to speak about that grassroots activism on an actual case of the Edmonton incinerator. Um, again, thank you, Georgia. I understand you have to slip away at 8.30, but really privileged to have had you here tonight. Huge appreciation. And I'd like to hand the floor over to Raj. Great, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Laura, for inviting me and everyone for having me this evening. Uh, if I may, I've got some slides to share. So if I could just share my screen with you, excellent. And hopefully you could see this, yeah. Okay, I'll kick off. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name's Raj Pereira. I'm actually a, a, a chair, chair of the Enfield and Haringey COP26 coalition. I'm a recently retired physics lecturer. My background is in physics and I've got a long standing history of uh, activism, uh, princi principally anti-racist activism. And if you like, what drew me towards the Stop the Edmonton Incinerator campaign, I was in Extinction Rebellion three years ago. And I remember in Haringey XR, that the issue of the Edmonton incinerator came up. Um, it got the go ahead in 2017. And the arguments really presented against it were very sound, yeah? That we should be uh, recycling, we should be uh, moving towards a circular economy, reducing stuff, reusing stuff, recycling, composting, all these things that push towards a circular economy rather than simply burning waste, simply burning what's in black bin liners. And increasingly, 
The stuff is made up of plastic, single-use plastics. We know this. Where do they come from? They come from fossil fuels. So whenever you get a, a, an incinerator, you're effectively uh, have a, a, a vast infrastructure that's polluting the atmosphere with carbon uh, because plastics and so on and so forth ultimately come from fossil fuels. And so the COP26 coalition, the whole mobilization around Glasgow was down to really the politics of the COP26 uh, coalition, which I'll just stress is based on climate justice. And this concept of climate justice is not a separate concept, it's mutable, meaning that it, it changes to the concept of social justice. So for us in the coalition, climate justice and social justice are interchangeable. They go hand in hand. And therefore, when it came to the incinerator, there's no question about it. Uh, and Georgia has really described well the amount of greenwash that we have to fight. Because the truth of it is, uh, this project, the incinerator, is designed, the new expanded incinerator, it's going to be 40% bigger than it was back in the uh, 1970s. That's when it was first built. Um, and it's going to uh, generate a small amount of heat. And there's been problems with incinerators on the continent that have broken down, that haven't been able to provide heat on a sustainable level. George has mentioned these, these problems. And therefore, to opt for incineration in a climate crisis is really a retrograde step. And we argue it's an act of climate uh, lunacy to do this. And the thing about climate justice is have a look at this map yeah uh everything in purple here are areas that are the most deprived areas in the united kingdom yeah the lighter areas is less deprived now where you see a yellow dot is where there is an incinerator and what you're seeing here is a law of society when it comes to dumping waste on people, and, and the law is this, that incinerators are likely to be built, uh, three times more likely to be built in areas of extreme deprivation and poverty. And, and this is uh, a law. And so, uh, you know, that there, there are 90 odd incinerators up and down the country. The government now, which is ridiculous again, in terms of reaching net zero by 2050, are planning 50 more incinerators. So we've got 140 sort of odd incinerators. And the one in North London, you know, 700,000 tonnes of waste are going to be changed and converted into 700,000 tonnes of carbon every year. And really, the, there is, a, Georgia described it well, there's a get out clause internationally when it comes to uh, uh, the burning of, few, uh, of, uh, of waste and incinerators. The carbon emissions don't count. They're not counted in this grand scheme of things uh, because we, we get some heat from this thing. And that's all, that's the rationale. And Georgia said it's the, the, uh, the cart leading the horse here. And that's exactly what's going on. Um, okay, so, and the thing about the racism here is if you look at uh, the campaign three years ago, we, we hit the headlines, you know, um, not three years ago, sorry. Uh, just last September, the campaign had built up. We've done the petitions. We've done the uh, um, uh, um, uh, mobilizing outside council meetings and so on and so forth. And there was a demonstration. And this was last September. And what you're seeing here are the, the forces that mobilized for that demonstration. They were the usual suspects. Extinction Rebellion, fantastically important, but also Black Lives Matter. Uh, 
perhaps you've seen Delia Mattis, who's a central uh, uh, black female activist in uh, Black Lives Matter. She gave the campaign a, a, an extra, if you like, a wind in the sails as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, because where this incinerator is built, we're talking predominantly black, Asian, 60% uh, plus uh, uh, racially diverse and ethnically diverse. So this is an act of environmental racism. And therefore, uh, we took it up uh, uh, as, as an instance of this. And so last September, it was a fantastic demonstration, 200 people. We occupied the North Circular Road. The police couldn't control the demonstration. And it was really uplifting. And uh, it got into the press. And this is really important, really, to have these sorts of mobilizations that raises the campaign. And in a sense, we begin to dominate the narrative. Uh, a lot of people throughout North London didn't have a clue about the incinerator. But it's after mobilizations like this, then it gets in the news and we begin to sort of dictate a little bit the narrative. And it's unfortunately a rule of thumb that the further you go away from Edmonton, there's seven North London boroughs involved in the North London Waste Authority. The further you go away, the issue doesn't really hit in the popular, uh, if you like, psychology of people because they're far away from it. Um, and here's, uh, this was really an exciting day, this image. This is when XR, um, Black Lives Matter, and people essentially on the left got together. They uh, organized a blockade of the four entrances of the incinerator. And this was the week that they were gonna vote for the incinerator. And this was brilliant because it was only about 40 people. It hit the national papers. This is from the Guardian. And it came out on the same day as the all parliamentary group uh, 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 committee report on air pollution, on, on waste pollution from incinerators. And I'm glad Phil has posted that in the chat. And I am going to go back to this document and highlight some of its key findings. But it's quite horrific in North London. It's what they are doing is just burning black, black uh, bin liner waste. And the real difficulty we're faced with is this graph. What does it show? It shows that uh, after year in, year out, this goes from 2010 nearly up to 2019, the green almost flat line is recycling. In London, the recycling rates is 30%, and that is below the national recycling rate of 49%. And some places that have really got on top of the problem can reach recycling rates of 70%, even touching 80%. Yeah, you could recycle your waste instead of burning it. But you see what has happened. No real action on recycling. And you see the red line getting bigger and bigger year in, year out. And this is incineration. So... They haven't really, the powers that be, the councils, haven't really dealt with the problem at all about recycling. They've opted for the their easy solution, a solution that brings them money, is to engage in incineration like this. So incinerators grow. And the problem with this, and this looks like a strange graph to show you, but on the bottom is the rate of incineration. And on the top is recycling. And it's a very simple rule if you draw a best fit, fit line. The more incineration that happens in society, in your community, in your city, the less recycling uh, takes place. And therefore the decision to go ahead with the incinerator is embedding two things, the commodification of waste and the prof profitability of waste, because this is what's been incentivized. When you expand an incinerator, there is less 
money, less resources going into good waste management systems. You know, that means cleaner streets, greener spaces, especially in a deprived community in North London. And so this is being uh, embedded in. And all right, the cars, pap, yeah, eventually they'll go electric and so on and so forth. But yeah, but look, this will be, the incinerator in Edmonton will be the biggest source, single source of carbon emissions in all of London. And if you count, uh, if you get rid of the legal loophole and count the emissions, there'll be absolutely no way that the gov government can meet their 2050 targets. And the real killer here, and these, and I'll go back to bits of the report, the real killer is something called particulate matter. You should have heard of this particular matter, in particular 2.5. The 2.5 is 2.5 microns. We are dealing with waste that behaves as a very fine, rarefied gas. And here's the big stumbling block. There is no uh, filter system that could uh, prevent a fine, rarefied gas from escaping. And this, this really is at the cause of Ella Kissy Deborah's death. She lived 25 meters away from the South Circular Road, and that's the air pollution from cars, but it's, a, sorry, it's pollution from cars that still contains particulate matter. It's the incinerator and also with air uh, 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 pollution from, from cars, and that led to a death. I think in three years, she's, uh, uh, or, even a year, she had to, I think it's three years, to see the doctor a hundred times and the doctor not having a clue as to why her asthma is getting worse day in, day out. Every day she's walking up and down to school, she's exposed to this thing. And this is why Ella, uh, Ross Kissy Deborah, her mother, is launching a battle to make uh, uh, clean air a fundamental human right. And, and her death is the first, first death down to air pollution. And Georgia mentioned the horrors involved with the stuff that comes out and the biomonitoring she mentioned of the dioxins in chicken eggs, in grass and moss. Uh, all these are biomarkers that clearly show, this is the new research, that so show the dioxins in very close pro proximity to incinerators. The same in sheep wool and, and in, in, in moths. Um, again, how frequently do they monitor this? By law, I was shocked at this, don't want you to read everything, but they are only required to monitor the air levels for two six hour periods uh, a year, that's it. And that, so the problems of breakdowns, tests, starting these things called uh, other than normal operating conditions and the spewing out of uh, the uh, horrible waste, that doesn't get, get uh, uh, counted. So the demands are for continuous monitoring, sampling for several weeks, not, not two six hour sessions when it's meant to be operating normally. So real loopholes there. And Georgia mentioned heavy metals in the toenails of children. And this is, you know, when I read this, I was horrified. You know, I suggest parents, yeah, you cut your toenails of your children, keep them for a lawsuit to fight and fight because it's horrific uh, to find this, uh, these results. Uh, so look, uh, there are neurotoxic effects, behavioral effects, cognitive effects from the manganese that's around, that's out there, the copper that, that comes out affects our DNA. And here's a crucial thing, nickel, nickel uh, in concentrations were found in the hair of pregnant women and in the fetal placenta. And this is connected with increased congenital heart disease. So it's a horror story. And there's no regulation here. Yeah, uh, you know, this loophole in the law uh, allows some pollutants not even to be studied or even known or talked about. They really haven't got the full scope of all the uh, horrific stuff 
that comes out. So there's a class of pollutants that doesn't get monitored at all. Uh, the levels on nitrous oxide, NOx emissions, are, you know, are just a limit. And different countries have their own limits when it comes to NOx. And it's ridiculous that there's no incentive at all, no fiscal, if you like, polluter must pay policy that, that addresses this, especially for, for nitrous oxide and so on and so forth. Um, and so there's no economic instrument from the government to really make, make polluters pay. I'll, I'll go on a bit. So, so we've had the science here, uh, and, and that, this is why all the health experts, the APPG re report was uh, based on these meta studies that point to the horrors associated uh, with the medical effects of these pollutants, okay? And there's no question that respiratory problems, cardiovascular problems are down to particulate matter. This is why the doctors in Edmonton were up in arms and part, part of our movement. They're organizing. And the hospital is just around the corner from the incinerator. You know, and there's a North Circular Road. It's just a not a pleasant environment at all. And the question we have to ask ourselves, why is, why is there no incinerator in Chelsea or, or you know, High Hampstead, South Kensington? They don't put it in the posh areas. And this is the reason why. When you come out of London, uh, uh, it's very, uh, it's a diverse demographic. As you come out of London, it generally gets whiter. It generally gets wealthier and it generally gets leafier. The air quality is relatively better if you're in the countryside. But where does the waste go? The waste goes, <laughs> yeah, to Edmonton. Yeah, that's the reality. So it's all about class. It is all about race. And I want to end with showing you a two minute clip of our demonstration. But think on this. And I'll give you one statistic. There are 64,000 deaths per year in the UK due to air pollution. And I ask you this, is that uh, uh, um, just uh, what word describes this statistic? Yeah. And on a global scale, it's 8.7 million deaths. And you think, all right, war in Ukraine, how many refugees? Nearly 10 million refugees. Well, if you think. Nine million people die each year globally from air pollution. What do you call this? Do you call it unfortunate? Do you call it something we have to put up with? I'll tell you what I called it. I called it social murder. And if you Google social murder, the body that recently uh, uh, talked about it in a very important journal, the British Medical Journal, raised the concept of social murder when it came to deaths due to COVID. If you think 150,000 deaths due to COVID and think of the government catastrophe in allowing this to happen. In the same way, if you allow 64,000 deaths a year from air pollution, what else do you call it? This is social murder. And it may have come from the British Medical Journal, but it comes from Friedrich Engels, everyone. Yeah? Raj, that radical, thank you. I'll, thank I'll, you so okay. much for your passionate okay. uh, presentation there. We'll keep your video until the end because we okay. are running over our planned plan for this evening. But my goodness, what a low, lot of very rich, powerful information you have presented tonight and so passionately presented to these doctors of um, protesting there. That's such a strong statement. We're going to keep the questions also until the end now, because there was a lot of information there. I'm not sure there'll be, we'll wait until the end of Paula's presentation and see how much time we have remaining. So Paula, are you screen sharing? Would you like to take it away and tell us about Stop Portland Waste Incinerator? Hi, yes, I'd like to share my screen. Um, here we go. I'm just going to dive in because uh, 
uh, that's the best way to do it. Um, okay, in 2013, it, planning permission was given for burning rubber uh, tires and palm oil, and that generated a huge outcry, uh, but it failed to stop it happening. And in Dorset, the pressure to achieve the climate ecological emergency was successful. So in May 2019, that status was declared. And De December of the same year, the applicants for this um, incinerator did a public exhibition and we all turned up and we were all very polite, but we were certainly not impressed because here we have the most beautiful place on earth that is unique and so important to us all. And we're talking about waste. People get confused about landfill and they think they don't like landfill, but this incinerator burns RDF. It's not going to landfill ever. It's specialized, um, fine-tuned material. And in Dorset, it currently all goes to the area where the red uh, um, ring is, to Parley and um, uh, Clanford Magna. The RDF is then um, sent off to waste incineration. And at the moment, Dorset has achieved over 60% recycling. So we're doing extremely well. There is an impetus to be very careful with waste miles, but it makes absolutely no sense to uh, send all your material to uh, become RDF and sift it out, and then to send it back down to here, to Portland, to be burnt. And unfortunately, um, last week, the week before last, the waste incinerator application for Parley, an intensification of the RDF purveyor, was approved. It may get called in by the inspector, but I wouldn't hold out much hope on that. So what we have is a situation here in this map with Dorset, we are incredibly good at sorting our waste. A contract has been let so that it will no longer go to uh, Southampton or uh, partially to Europe. It will all be going to Bridgewater, which is this brand new facility. And in the southwest, you can go to the, the government waste data interrogator and you can see what all the ins and outs of where waste is moving in Britain. And in the southwest, we already have a surplus capacity for waste incineration. And you can see here that our inert our landfill is inert rubble. So that is never going to go to an incinerator. So we're recycling 60% and it's turning into real materials. We are contracted to go to Bridgewater and Westbury was approved last June and Parley was approved a couple of weeks ago. And, and uh, this graph, you've seen some other graphs, but basically there is this argument that as the economy grows, we're gonna generate more waste. But now the reality is clearly identified in this top graph that waste totals sort of stay pretty much the same, but what isn't going to landfill and is becoming reduced is being taken up with incineration. And as this green of recycling increases, basically the only product that there is is to burn those recyclers. The reason I got involved with this and perhaps majority of people here is that we have a climate and ecological emergency and it's, it's not pretend. And here in Portland and Weymouth, we experience storms. This is a, a a photograph of a massive storm which had a huge impact in 2014. We've got a lot of low-lying land. You're not going to refreeze the Arctic and the Antarctic. It's melting far too fast and the energy in the system is building up massive storms. I'm a retired architect. I designed my house for one in 100 year storms and they're coming at re regular intervals. Portland is an island. It has one road in and that road flooded uh, last time in 2014, we have congestion on that road. We have difficulties with that road. It is the lifeline for 15,000 people who live on Portland. But Portland is international. Portland is where the world learned that um, in evolution happened. 
that's why we've got UNESCO um, World Heritage Status. The, the Jurassic geology taught humankind that extinctions happened. And this is where our site is. It's right in the middle of the World Heritage Site. So we've been campaigning, making sure that UNESCO know, know all about it. UNESCO are talking to the government, but they can't do anything unless the British government takes action. So we could be like Liverpool and lose our status. Portland is such a beautiful place. It's got amazing wildlife. It's got protected status for habitats. It's where migratory birds come. It's just such a fantastic place. And we all know after COVID how important our natural world is. But we've also got amazing conservation seas. We've got a whole wealth of industry that is based on this, these natural assets. And yet, as we as campaigners try to get the marine organizations to come alongside and to put pressure on um, um, Natural England to say this is not uh, satisfactory, they all shift the buck, not our remit. So what we have is an island inhabited by 15,000 people, and there are people that will be living above the top of the flue. This very grey photograph is the applicant's only drawing, only image of the plume coming out. And this is where Laura lives up there, nicely above the flue. And Portland is amazingly um, particular because it has this topography of an island which captures the wind and um, it causes eddies and freddies so that the the, you get down drafts around the island and you get this cap that sits on top of the island frequently, which will capture its static air and it'll capture the flu gases coming out. To get to the port, the, at the site is within the port and the only road into the port is through Castletown. And you can see that people live here right on the edge of the road. So you, you come through Weymouth, you cross the causeway, and you come through C Castletown. But Castletown is also a destination now. It's an attraction. It's got the D-Day Museum. It's got um, uh, King Henry VIII's castle. It's, it's teeming with heritage assets, they're called. But basically, the history and the buildings here are important and they will be have, have negative impact from, from this incinerator. And, and you know, the war graves, people didn't fight to then have people living in, in this pollution. So when you're at the top of the island, right above the site, there's a cafe that's run by the prison uh, authorities. It's part of HMS Burn at the top. And you can look down on the site and oh, that, that's an overground fuel pipe, which serves the fueling bunkering for all the shipping that comes in. Uh, obviously is um, a big issue. So what we have is the biggest threat of all is that Dorset waste is extremely well managed. The municipal solid waste is sorted. The proposal is for 202,000 tonnes of waste and it has a storage space designed to take a cargo ship's worth of fuel coming in. And that fuel coming in, the RDF, the Environment Agency, do not monitor what's in it. That is a confidential contract between the supplier of it and the end user. And once they've taken in their stuff and burnt it, a fifth of it comes out as toxic ash. And this applicant says it will be loading it into cargo ships to take away by a mechanical grabber. And that's a mechanical grabber. And that's what happens in Dublin. So we've got, to that, we've got this big storage capacity for the RDF coming in cargo ships. And it's, there's big attention given to fire prevention because it self ignites. So they, they're proposing to put a sprinkler system in but the reality is 
that accidents happen. And if an accident happens there, and accidents do happen in the port, it's a very constrained place to access to. But when those car, um, cruise ships comes in, if you stay on board during the day or sleeping at night, you're at the same height as the top of the flue of the incinerator. So there's a, there's a very good um, video of how this whole thing puts together. But what I wanted to add to the criticism of the Environment Agency is when you read the permits and the latest permit for the brand new incinerator that's nearly finished at Bridgewater, that permit sets out the limitations on emissions and there is no limit in the latest permit for PCBs and dioxins. So you, the whole thing about the permitting best available technology, it's controls that were set before the climate and ecological emergency. The Environment Agency can't increase their standards. They have to work within that legislation. And we are presented with a proposal here, which on a good day when it's running normally is unacceptable. But if there is, an arising emergency, it's just going to be dreadful. And hope, 80 lorry movements a day. And we already have the single road frequently stopped. And this, this is a shot, if anybody familiar, is right at the beginning of the causeway, but the congestion will go right up onto the top of the island, right to the um, um, villages on the top of the island. And we already have large volume HTV movements. Another 80 day will make life really, really hard for people. And that's one every nine minutes if they control it to daylight hours. And the really, the really fundamental thing that completely knocked me out was the port says, we have to have a shore power for our cruise ship business. This 15 megawatts that we produce is going to be just such green energy. It's not green energy, and 15 megawatts could be supplied by one wind turbine. It's just unreal. The carbon intensity of waste incineration is currently four times the carbon intensity of the national grid. And once you build an incinerator, it's going to run for 30 plus years. It cannot decarbon downwards, it's just going to be locked in this dirty power system. So our local economy of Dorset, the whole of Dorset depends on our beautiful environment. If this incinerator is built, it'll be there well beyond 2050. It will be fed by imported waste. It'll be making profit for a few, but it will, its impact will be on so many more people. And, Believe you me, these are huge buildings. At the bottom right, that's two people looking at this building. It is humongous. Our Dorset, Portland and Weymouth is such an important international place. It's also an international sailing arena. It just can't happen. These people so far have raised, and we have spent 80,000 pounds doing the job that local authorities should be paying for to buy expert reports. We've had a series of air quality assessments. And each time the applicants come up with new data, the experts that are independent that we've paid for have found fault in them. Today, the environmental lawyers' freeths have come back with their draft of their recent revisiting it all and still find fault in it. It's unacceptable. It should be refused. But the awful thing is, even if it is refused at planning, the applicants have got so much money, they will go to appeal. And so we'll have to pay for experts to represent it because it needs experts to represent it. People like me, we know a lot about it, but we, we're we only the public voice. It's experts that have to be paid for. And if the planners recommend it for approval, we'll seek to get it called in, but you have to pay for a barrister to represent you. So it, it's more money each time. And 
it's inadequate. It's not just the planning, it's the environmental permit, which is running as well. And inadequate, 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 inadequate. There we go. Isn't it a wonderful place? <laughs> I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Oh, Paula, my heart goes out to you. Have put. Well, it's all our, it's our world, isn't it? It's just. <sighs> You've put so much effort into this. Everybody in this local area is so absolutely indebted to you for the effort that you've put into this and um, thank so you not, it's we're a team and then we've got some amazing people there so yeah so we've got a remaining 10 or so minutes for questions if we i'd like to open the floor to everybody that's come today if you have any thoughts in your mind of things that you'd like to share questions of the remaining two speakers here Raj and Paula. If you can raise your hand. Yeah, and I, that's why I said so. Alistair's just prompted about Raj's video. Absolutely. We'll finish up with that. Geo, we'll call you in, please. Yeah, I just want to actually thank all the speakers. It's not my job really, but I am just a bit in awe of all of their talks. And Paula's presentation was fantastic. And just just one note, it, it it can look with all our beautiful Jurassic Coast and countryside and sailing that we're kind of all quite well off here. But actually, we have to remember that Weymouth and Portland do have the highest levels of deprivation in the whole of Dorset. So it's no accident that that's where they want to stick this big, dirty thing. So, um, you know, it, a, a bit in line with yours, Raj. I just had to say that because it just makes me mad. I nearly swore then. Sorry. Thank you. That was all. <laughs> Thank you, Dio. Phil, you've got your hand up next. Yes, excuse me, having another go. I just wanted to add to what Giovanna has said and refer back to Raji's comments about where incinerators are placed. Um, it's not just that Weymouth and Portland is the most deprived area of Dorset and one of the most deprived in the southwest. And for people who don't know, in 2018, Weymouth and Portland had the lowest average weekly wages in the whole of the UK. But that Underhill, which is after all, essentially where the incinerator is planned, it's planned the incinerator will be placed, has got one of the very highest levels of child poverty in the whole of the South and Southwest. So 43% of all children in Underhill live officially in poverty. I mean, this is, heaping deprivation upon multiple deprivation. As Raj says, it is a class issue. Uh, and it's glaringly, glaringly so. It's a, it is indeed a matter of climate justice and of social justice. And I'm sure that's an added motivator for us to get behind the local campaign, as well as maybe to link up. I can see now the importance of linking up with other campaigns with the Edmonton campaign, thanks very much to Georgia and to Raj, but also to keep an eye out for other campaigns around the country with which we can link and develop some, you know, collective confidence and solidarity. Absolutely, Phil. We all need to be marching to the centre with all our campaign banners. There's, there's multiple campaigns across the country that could do that. I think we need to make that happen. So Peter and then Sarah. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I live in Swanage, uh, and, and clearly the more people from Dorset who can support the campaign, the, the better. Um, and it would be great to whip up more support ar around the county. Is, is there any sort of data about how far the particulates can travel? Because people would be far more interested, perhaps, if they, if they knew that the particulates could travel a certain distance with a following wind. Yes, I do know the answer, but Paula or Raj? Well, the, the interesting thing is that once pollution gets into the system, that does travel a long way. Talking to the harbour ferryman, he took an interest in the sediment testing that was done off Winfrith, our uh, nuclear power station on the Dorset coast. The sediments there weren't actually contaminated with Win Win Winfrith um, 
radiation. It was coming from France. It was coming from Cap de Lague. So this climate emergency is, you know, it's everybody. And, and the reason that I think that this is such, such an important, effective thing that we can do to stop 202,000 tons of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So yeah, you might not get a, you might not have pre-existing conditions and, and suffer dramatically beyond the 15 kilometer zone, but we sure all are gonna suffer from increased flooding, increased storm damage, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they say, you know, they'll be carbon neutral because we're going to plant trees to offset the carbon emissions, but it takes one broadleaf tree a hundred years to sequester one ton of emissions. So that's, you know, in a week, 577 trees that each have to live a hundred years to offset one week's worth of emissions, you know, times that by a year, times that by 30 years, it's obscene. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Thank you for that question and answer, Paula and Peter. Sarah, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> yes hi, uh, thanks for all the amazing talks and for organizing this. Um, not, as a naive question, um, do we have any purchase in fighting it via the, the POPs, these persistent organic pollutants that it, they do give off, given there is legislation around the persistent organic pollutants and how, there, there is legislation, I shared the links, on how the uh, the UK is supposed to adhere or respond to the Stockholm um, Treaty or Convention, whatever it's called. Um, so just as a, you know, because these pops are so horrendous, I mean, they're in the breast milk of every mammal on the planet from women, you know, near or not near these, these um, effluents to um, Arctic, Arctic whales. So, um, and I, I don't know if George is still here, but I got the idea there wasn't a lot of purchase, but I just wanted to ask, you know, if there might yeah. be. Thank you, Sarah. No, Georgia has gone. She probably would have been the best one to answer this question unless anybody else knows the answer to this, but it's a very good question. Paula, you? Well, I, I just think that in terms of Dorset, this planning application will be considered by a Dorset-wide elected councillors, the strategic uh, planning committee. So across Dorset, the more people that tune in to our responsibility to consider the commodities that we buy or not buy, to think about waste as a big issue that affects climate change, the more people start focusing on the subject and don't think, oh, well, we just don't want landfill burning, it's such a tidy solution. The more we talk about it, the more chance we have that those decision makers will tap into the reality rather than the emotion. So please talk to everybody about it, find out about it, talk to everybody about it. So Raj, I wonder, Sarah's question, I think was a bit more sort of general across yeah. the country taking higher beings to to court over the pollution that's now being proved is it have you got anything to add on that raj just on where the pops do go uh professor vivian howard who was a key contributor to the appg report he explained it well uh to um to actually the north london waste authority on the day they voted for the incinerator these things just get out completely dispersed through the whole biosphere he talked about uh the pops they they go to all to the uh polar caps the arctic and the antarctic and because the permafrost is thawing these things which are horrific and we really don't know the science of how they will uh, affect the um, ecosystems that we have and so on and so forth with the melting of the permafrost all this gets thrown into the biosphere in unpredictable ways in many ways just like the coronavirus is not if you like an act out of 
uh, uh, out of uh, a, a, will, a natural disaster, put it that way. All these problems are down to the system we live under. Incinerators are symptomatic of the whole system we live under. Uh, and uh, really what Georgia said is we need to fight for system change. Anyway, I'm dying to show you our video of two minutes of our demonstration. Is that OK? Yeah. I think let's do that and then we'll finish okay. on time. And then if you'd like to stay, Sarah, and others can stay as well to discuss this a little further, that would be really fantastic. But I'm just mindful that it would be good okay. to finish at nine o'clock for those that are expecting that. And fantastic. we'll stay on a bit longer to answer any more questions. Okay, this is really um, a, a big difference from our demonstration. You saw some images of uh, six months ago. Uh, it's just the numbers that we got here. So you see Georgia and myself. It's massively oversized. About 60% of its feedstock is recyclable, but it's cheaper to burn it. I want to know whether you will hold to your pledge of 100% clean energy at Atsiona and withdraw from bidding for this massively oversized, locally opposed incinerator. The massive oversizing of the plant is uh, something that is uh, beyond our control. We are powerful. We will not be stopped. We are on the right side of history, which means we will win. We are the people of Edmonton and we are going to stop this incinerator. It makes absolutely no sense knowing what we know now about climate change, about environmental racism, about the need to, to curb continued growth and extraction to go ahead with this project. This incinerator is a symptom of what is wrong with the entire system we have. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Such an empowering way to finish up this evening. I really huge thanks, Raj, Paula and Georgia for coming along this evening and sharing your wealth of knowledge and for volunteering your time to have learned so much about these monstrosities and then sharing it with others. We're truly grateful. And I want to put a special thanks also to Phil for organizing this evening. Thanks to him for bringing us all together. And I'm excited for what might come as a result of this evening. It sounds like there is energy for a united uh, countrywide protest against incineration um, and put the monitorium on any new and then phase out all existing as rapidly as possible. If you'd like to unmute, say good night, say thank you, type in the, in the chat, um, or if you would like to stay on, I'll stop the video, but if you'd like to stay on and keep chatting, we will stay for a, for a short while longer. Good night, everyone. <laughs>